Ladies and gentlemen, GCU ACM student chapter welcomes you all to this ACM Distinguished Speaker Talk, where we talk about being actively ethical, dynamic HCI for AI. My name is Ashna Beg, and I will be your host. Let me give you a brief idea about what this talk is going to be about. Artificially intelligent technologies are exciting, and with them come new and intimidating responsibilities. How do we understand and clarify our users' needs for transparency, control, and access when the system is constantly changing? This talk will tell you what you can do to protect the people affected by these systems by utilizing ethics and speculative activities to preemptively identify potential misuse and abuse of these systems. Our guest speaker for today is Ms. Carol J. Smith, who is, a re, who is a senior research scientist in human machine interaction at Carnegie Mellon University, Software Engineering Institute, and an adjunct instu instructor for CMU's Human Computer Interaction Institute. She has been con conducting research to improve the human experience across industries for 20 years and working to improve artificially intelligent systems since 2015. She has led research and interaction design projects with nonprofit organizations, large corporations, government agencies, and academia. She is recognized globally as a leader in HCI with multiple publications, over 160 speaking engagements in 45 cities around the world, and as an active HCI community organizer. Without further ado, I would like to ask Ms. Carol Smith to begin with the talk. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And you should be able to see the slides. Can you see the slides? <laughs> All right, I'm going to assume we can. Wonderful. Thank you all um, for being here. Oh, is that yes? Yes, ma'am, it is visible. Wonderful, wonderful. So I will get right into it after a copyright statement. I do like to acknowledge uh, the land I speak on. Uh, the United States uh, has a, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, quite a history. And uh, one of the um, aspects uh, here that is important is acknowledging uh, that the land that uh, I am currently on, uh, my home is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the United States. And this is the land uh, of the Monongahela, the Adena, and the Hopewell Nations the Seneca, Lenape, and Shawnee lands, and the Osage, Delaware, and Iroquois lands. And these individuals um, have made innumerable contributions to my region and our country. And this area is now known as Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I actually live, um, uh, there's a spot on this map that says Squirrel Hill, and that's my neighborhood, which is nice. Um, I do wanna also acknowledge uh, the ACM. Uh, the Association for Computing Machinery makes these talks possible. And it is a huge organization with nearly 100,000 members in more than 170 countries uh, around the world. And uh, there are many, many uh, great uh, publications that they create and uh, those are um, free to uh, members. And I'm proud to be an ACM member. And uh, they uh, make this, this whole um, uh, ex uh, event possible. So briefly, um, as I'm sure you're aware, we have been using machines, uh, com computing types of things, things that help us to count or help us to do work uh, more uh, easily, more quickly um, for well, the hundreds and thousands of years. Um, this is an image of a wire-powered um, automated orchestra um, from 1206. Uh, and these types of um, machines were made really, again, to help us be more uh, powerful, more creative, more, do more, to augment us. And that's what we want um, AI systems to do as well. We want these new systems to also augment our work. And so when we're working with uh, artificial intelligence, um, and primarily I'm going to be speaking about machine learning uh, today, that type of technology, if, if you're curious what I mean by AI, um, these systems uh, have less physical interaction in some cases, um, but much more information. 
Um, and so we need to really pay attention not only to what is being displayed, but how it's being interpreted, how the people who are going to use the system are going to uh, understand the information that's being displayed. So in this image, we see a physician um, or a surgeon looking at uh, a display of information, and that individual needs to understand what they're seeing and understand what that means for the decisions they need to make. Whereas in the background, we see a patient in, um, in a uh, machine that they need to, to trust to an extent in order to lay there and, and allow the scans to be created. And the uh, attendant, the um, uh, person who is attending to that patient also needs to have some awareness of the system. So all of these individuals have very different interactions with the system that includes some aspects of artificial intelligence. And we need to make sure that each of these individuals has an appropriate experience. If we gave them all the same information, if all of them saw what the physician saw, uh, they wouldn't necessarily get the right information. So today what I'm going to be talking about is what it takes to really make systems responsible and human-centered ethical um, artificial intelligence systems. So uh, if you're familiar with the user experience honeycomb uh, there on the left, the uh, ideas of user experience and, and making good systems so useful and desirable, valuable, accessible, all of these aspects, we need to translate those to um, responsible and human-centered um, AI systems now. Um, and so thinking about how to do that um, is really um, complex in many ways because the systems are dynamic. So we need to broaden our work um, and think about what in this uh, system, what, what is the current situation and how might AI improve it, but also is AI the right solution for this? Is this an AI friendly challenge? So a huge um, you know, key aspect of AI systems is, of course, the data. Without data, you can't make an AI system. So we need to understand that aspect as well as what we expect the system to do so that we have a baseline of what currently is happening in the situation. How are people currently getting their work done? And then what are we expecting the system to provide them additionally? What improvements are we making? And how will we know we've made those improvements? Um, as well as understanding the benefits of the system and the risks. And so uh, the work that we, I've been doing at the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon is figuring out what it is to make a system human-centered. And we talk about three aspects um, that are about designing systems to work with and for people. So the assumption is, of course, that this is an effective implementation, that the system is being made uh, to be robust and scalable and, and all those aspects of um, the meanings of those words and that we are working to minimize unintended consequences so that we um, understand um, what the risks are and that we've, we're doing the work to make sure that we don't do any harm that, uh, that, you know, that we can prevent. And so we wanna uh, go through three steps of learning along the way, understanding the complexity of the context for the people who will use the system, designing for human machine teaming, and engaging in critical oversight. And I'll go through all three of these. And if there are questions, I can't see the, um, the Teams interface. So if there are questions, if someone can uh, unmute and interrupt me, that would be great. Um, but otherwise, we will have time for questions afterwards. So I'll talk about understanding the complexity of context first. So this is really about looking at, again, the desired outcome. What are the needs of the individuals who are going to use this system? And what are we creating to support them? And what are the factors, the human factors, as well as the contextual factors that uh, will affect the outcome? So we want to first think about, are the human and uh, AI aware of when there are shifts in context? Uh, how will we maintain clarity around the operational intent? So if, if something changes during the interaction, how are we going to uh, communicate that? And how do we adapt and evolve uh, the system based on dynamic context? So if the system gains new information, how do we provide that to the human using the system and vice versa, when the human uh, gains more knowledge or more awareness of the situation, how do we convey that to the computer, to the interface in the machine? Um, and so thinking about all the complexity um, in that uh, is, is new, this is new work. Um, and the complexity includes, of course, the environmental context. So if we're working with drones or uh, autonomous vehicles or, or anything that would be out in the field, a, a, a tablet or, or some kind of, um, you know, uh, 
uh, mobile interface, um, we certainly need to think about the environmental context, um, but also even inside. So in a hospital, um, as that previous image indicated, we need to think about um, how loud it might be in certain situations and how urgent things are. And from the human perspective, we need to think about how tired are these individuals? How distracted are they? Um, what are the competing other priorities that they need to attend to? And how can we balance that much like we do for normal user interface uh, situations? And then what are the real capabilities of the system? What can it do? What what is it not capable of doing and how do we communicate that? And then information as it's coming into the system. Um, these systems, uh, currently most systems do not um, update very quickly because uh, it's more difficult to manage a system that is constantly um, changing. Um, but as it, information is ingested into the system and as it changes, we need to make sure that we know um, how to convey that. And again, from the human perspective as well. So some of this is looking at that collaboration um, early on, understanding what the activities are, understanding what the interactions are and managing that for the people and thinking about timing. So how long are the interactions with these individuals? Are they very short and hectic? In, uh, interactions? Are they longer and more cyclical? Um, what is happening and what changes uh, over the time that those occur? And also looking at aspects of collaboration. Uh, collaboration with, with anyone, but particularly with a, uh, a machine, would require clear communication, negotiation, so how are we making a decision, and then coordination as far as actually doing that activity. Um, and so we need to think about how that can affect the work. Um, this is from uh, some work that I've been doing with Dwayne Degler um, at Design for Context. And uh, we've been working through this and we're actually presenting at UXPA in a few weeks, um, our newest work on this. Um, and one of the aspects of this is uh, looking at, again, those time cycles and understanding what the what the uh, catalyst is for the activity. So there was a request or an event occurs, something happens. And then during that interaction, again, that, that communication, negotiation, and coordination is occurring until closure of that particular activity. And again, this could be very, very fast. It could be a you know super quick interaction where someone just needs a quick piece of information, or if they're working with an autonomous system, um, there's you know uh, deciding for the human to, to take over. Um, or or it can be much longer if they're doing research or, or examining um, information or trying to make a longer term decision. So thinking about that timing obviously can affect how information is displayed and what information is displayed. Um, with that uh, semi-autonomous vehicle I was mentioning, um, if you have a situation on the left where um, it's uh, a little bit more um, controlled. So um, the system there on the bottom might identify something and communicate that to the human or the human could identify as well. And the system, the, uh, the vehicle in this case, might act on something. So perhaps it's uh, a sensing uh, someone merging into a lane. And so it may act slowing down a little bit to allow that vehicle in and then explain what happened and, and why it happened uh, through the interface. And then the uh, individual, the, the person operating the vehicle might um, make further instructions. Uh, and they may also, if it was a very fast interaction, so if they, uh, you know, were really um, seeing that road obstruction and, and jerked uh, the vehicle um, in a way, the, the human may, you know, respond, you know, and, and need to recover. Um, so this, this can happen, again, slowly or quickly. Um, but the idea is here that, that the human actually wasn't involved for quite a while. So even if they both saw or, or identified that obstruction right away, the system may just react um, and then later on do that explanation. Um, or it could be a, a slower activity. And then on the right, um, there may not be time for the system or the system may not understand how to respond. And so it may make a very quick handoff to the human. And so that's a very different type of interaction um, and one where the human has to assess and act very quickly, but they have to have context to be able to do that. So again, thinking about what happens during these stages and how the system is going to respond differently given the situation is really an important aspect of this work.
So another example might be medical treatment uh, situations. So thinking about what is known now about the patient, about their situation, about the stage of their disease, and then what uh, is their situation? Are they able to get to the hospital for regular treatments? Are they able to um, pay for the treatment? And if not, how are we going to manage this situation? Are we going to find a more affordable treatment? Um, are we going to uh, make uh, choose a treatment that doesn't require as many uh, hospital visits? Um, and how how would we integrate new information as they recover, as they uh, get better? How do we communicate that to the system if the system is making future um, recommendations for treatment? So thinking about what is known and how to convey that to the system and making sure that those decisions are being made with that context versus trying to make decisions across all patients, which would uh, obviously not be an ideal situation. So thinking about safety is also very important. Um, how are we going to uh, get into and maintain safe states of systems? And that should be very easy to do. The easiest thing should be the safe thing to do. It should be very difficult to, um, to over accelerate in a vehicle. It should be very difficult to, um, to order um, a, an expensive or high demand treatment, a, a treatment that requires a lot of um, involvement by the patient. Those should be harder than the, the easier solutions, although perhaps not. This is obviously very important to understand the context. Um, actions that would lead to unsafe situations um, or a hazard should be harder to do. So something that would um, potentially hurt uh, the individual or others in the situation, th those types of things should be harder to do. And we need to make sure that the operators don't necessarily hold all the responsibility for detecting errors um, because it's just not realistic. We we are uh, you know distracted. We're humans. We uh, may not be able to uh, do what is needed in an appropriate amount of time. And so, making sure things like um, braking, automatic braking, uh, that's an excellent uh, new feature in vehicles. And those types of things can really help prevent accidents and, and save lives, obviously. So thinking about how to protect people is really important. This work is by uh, Nancy Levins that she's been uh, doing work uh, on complex systems for a very long time. Um, we also need to make systems effective team players. So they need to be easy to direct. We need to be able to uh, communicate the system's behavior to people um, and have them understand what it's doing as well as the human's behavior. Um, we need to make sure that the system is easily uh, and efficiently directed in general, that, that the person who's working with the system can, um, if something has changed or if they do not prefer the, the suggestion or recommendation that's being made, they should be able to uh, move forward in the way that they prefer, keeping the human in control in that way. And uh, especially when things are busy or it's a new situation, a novel situation, um, that is even more important for the human to be involved and to make sure that the system is conveying potentially its um, uh, you know, the fact that this is new or different um, as well, if, if it is aware of that. Um, and if it's not sure, if the system is uh, not confident um, or confident in more than one variable um, in the situation, then it should also be conveying that kind of um, unsurety to the human. We always want to capitalize on human strengths. Um, so, uh, representing uh, Amanda, Dr. Amanda Muller and I are representing this uh, at UXPA as well in a few weeks. Um, capitalizing on human strengths and really looking back at the existing work that has been done on what humans are better at and what machines are better at and thinking about what might be changing. Um, so, in our research, we found that humans are considered to be still better at exposing bias. Um, and identifying downstream impacts and judgment. Um, and it's interesting that uh, most people that we surveyed said that we're also better at recognizing bias and responding to change, uh, doing uh, differentiating between social and political nuances, uh, really understanding people and places and, and uh, the situations, and then taking context into consideration. These shouldn't be terribly surprising, but we did expect some of these to be a different result, which is just interesting to, to consider as systems are more powerful, but also as people are more aware of these systems, what might change in our perceptions, which is a really important aspect of this work. So context really, again, is, is research to understand the complexity of the system, the people, the environment, all the information involved, and what's changing over time, and really making sure that we're supporting designs that are providing clear communication, negotiation, and coordination. 
And uh, there are a lot of challenges with this work. Uh, we need to continue to demystify AI to our colleagues and help them understand what what these systems can and cannot do. We need to get time and budget for user experience uh, research and really spending time to understand the complexity um, using what works well, continuing to use those patterns, and then understanding, again, what changes with regard to time cycles. So then we need to move to uh, human machine teaming. And this work can be concurrent or um, you know, depending on your situation, all of, all of this work needs to be done, um, but sometimes it's easier to think about um, a little bit separately. If you have a big enough team, obviously you can do it uh, all at once, which is wonderful. So designing for human machine teaming is about interdependence. We're working with uh, the human obviously is autonomous. The system is mostly or semi-autonomous depending on the situation. And we don't want it to be fully autonomous in most cases because we always want a human to be able to control the situation. Um, so we, but we need to understand how that interaction works. And we need to um, make sure that the system can gain a calibrated level of trust. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, and also that the system is always providing transparency regarding its limitations. So trust, uh, a little bit on trust, trust is very personal. Uh, it's cal it needs to be calibrated based on our personal experiences, uh, our current context, and the available evidence that the system is providing about its capability and integrity. And so we may come into a situation um, with distrust of a system, um, meaning that we don't really think it can do what it says it can do. And then that might lead to disuse or, or rejection. Um, we may be over-trusting of a system, on the other hand, and uh, assume that the system can do much more, that it can exceed uh, the actual capabilities, which can lead to misuse because we're applying a system to a new situation that is not actually created to uh, be able to manage. And that's uh, referred to as automation bias, the fact that most humans really believe um, and are are more likely to favor suggestions from automated decision-making systems, even uh, with, uh, with knowledge of other information, contradictory information that's made without automation, they'll ignore that and, and believe the system more often. So we have to be very careful of that. We want to encourage uh, skeptical thinking with uh, any computing system because while humans, of course, make mistakes, um, these computers are made by humans and they are even more likely to make mistakes. And so we have to be uh, trusting of the human always, and they need to have a calibrated trust, a trust that matches the system's capabilities um, so that they're using the system appropriately. And so trust changes over time for, for people as they work with the system. And so you may have someone come in on their first experience with a, a pretty calibrated level of trust. And then as they work with the system, they may gain more trust along the time. And, you know, that may even out again to, to continuing to be calibrated. Someone may also come in with a complete overtrust of the system, and then that uh, becomes calibrated over time um, as they use the system. And then, of course, people come in potentially with a lot of distrust of a system. And so um, as they work with the system, ideally, they also gain a calibrated level of trust. And figuring out what the people who are using your system, um, what their mental model is of the system, what their level of trust as a default is, it may vary. But you know, ideally, if you're looking at a fairly narrow um, group of individuals, they probably have a fairly shared um, idea of the system. Um, but it's important to make sure that they are maintaining again, that, that calibrated trust once they continue to work with the system. Um, but figuring out how to do that is, is, uh, is not easy. Um, and we again, we want to encourage not only skepticism, but speculation. We want people on the teams making these systems to really think about how to keep people safe, how to make sure that the system is responsible and that we are doing intentional design, that we are creating systems that are safe and are trustworthy, um, calibrated, uh, calibratedly trustworthy, if that's a, if that's a word. Um, so the work to do this um, involves really activating people's curiosity, getting them to do activities that help them to think about the unintended and unwanted consequences of, team, of the, the product that they're creating. There are a couple methods for doing this, abusability testing that was coined by Dan Brown, Black Mirror episodes, which if you're familiar with the uh, sci-fi uh, TV series uh, called uh, Black Mirror, this is based on that, the idea that you're really thinking about the worst possible scenario. And this is all with the intent of being able to 
prevent those harms if possible, or at least to mitigate and make plans for if it is to occur. Um, and another uh, idea is to reward team members for finding ethical bugs. So really, again, just thinking through what could happen, how, what kind of abuse, what kind of misuse could occur with the system, and how can we protect people's information, protect uh, decisions that will be made about uh, individuals or groups of individuals, um, and thinking through that. And this work involves conversations, uh, and these conversations are not easy. The, these are difficult topics and, and difficult conversations, and this is new work for a lot of people in technology. But we do need to have conversations about what we value as a team, as a group, who could be hurt, what lines we want to make sure the system does not cross, so what is it not going to do, um, how are we shifting power, so who might be gaining from the system and who might be losing um, their uh, information or, or losing um, out on uh, some other type of change that the system is going to make. Uh, often jobs are a concern, um, although less so um, nowadays, it's certainly in certain sectors in uh, construction and then manufacturing and uh, those sectors, there's still, um, rightly so, a lot of concern about that. And so thinking about that and being aware of that's really important. Um, and then how are we gonna track our progress? And paying attention particularly to people who are in groups that are frequently marginalized. So in the United States, um, race is, is certainly a primary concern, but also um, uh, social class, so um, income levels, uh, you know, disparities because of a region that someone lives in, um, and then um, you know, many, many other issues. So really thinking about those individuals and how the system might further impact them because it's perpetuating uh, disparities that, that exist in the data itself. And I'll talk about that in a little while as well. So this is all, again, hard work. Um, in a lot of ways, building the technology is easier than building it right. Um, and so we need to think about how can we um, get be uncomfortable with this work and build systems that people are willing to be responsible for. So a system that I, if I am the one who's responsible for it, I'm willing to take responsibility for that because I know it's been built in a way that's going to protect people, um, that's not going to make the wrong kind of news headlines. And part of this is really understanding our natural biases. So biases are just shortcuts. These are ways that we avoid risk and simplify problems. Uh, we can credit our ancestors for having some bias to stay away from the dangerous animal um, or not eating the bad berries. Uh, th that's why we're here is because our ancestors had good uh, natural biases and, and enabled us to, to still be around. Um, so these aren't inherently bad, but we do misapply them. Um, some of them we're just not aware of. They're implicit or invisible to us. And they're not necessarily in sync with our actual beliefs, our conscious beliefs. So sometimes uh, we'll see someone and we'll have an immediate reaction to them and realize, oh, you know, that that is not fair, that's not what I believe. And so we can manage and change our behavior. We can manage and change our biases, um, but only if we are become aware of them and if we talk about them um, in non-threatening uh, and productive ways. So because of that, because we're all biased in many ways, and because we create the data, humans create data, data doesn't just rain down on us. Uh, someone has curated the information and collected it and made it for a reason. They, they, there was a reason why data exists. Um, so because of that, there, the system will always have bias and the idea of really complete objectivity isn't uh, possible. Um, but that bias can be purposeful and helpful and we just need to identify what that bias is. Our goal is obviously to reduce unintended or harmful biases. And one very effective way to do that is to adopt technical ethics. There are lots of sets of these, um, hundreds of them. Um, and I recommend uh, adopting one that will help you to harmonize across cultural variation. So everyone comes with an idea of what is and is not ethical and helping them to coalesce around a set of ethics is very helpful to everyone. Uh, it also helps to balance against the pace of change because people uh, feel the need to review these and make sure that the work that they're doing is the right work. And it also gives people permission, explicit permission to consider and question um, the breadth of implications. What uh, is this going to do once it gets into the real world? How is it going to react with new data? What if the new data um, changes the system? How are we going to manage that? This, this really can help you. Um, and again, there are many, many different sets. Um, 
And uh, one I, in particular, um, briefly, I, I, I want to recommend is the Montreal Declaration of Responsible AI. This is um, from the University de Montreal. And uh, it's a very good set. It's very broad. So it covers almost all types of technologies. Um, and uh, I, I think that it's a good place to start. And then um, as you move forward, you could always uh, adapt it specifically for your needs or perhaps uh, use a different set of technical ethics. So all of this relies on conversations and there are a lot of different tools out there that can be used to help you and your team to, to get those conversations going. One of them is this checklist um, and agreement. And it's not a checklist to just check, but rather to help um, the team to uh, question the work that they're doing and, and build those conversations around specific topics. Um, so this helps people to bridge gaps between uh, a set of technical ethics that might be rather vague. So um, if, this, if it says do no harm, the reality of that is that you definitely do not want hackers to get into your website or into your AI system for sure. So there is an aspect of, of intended harm and in that you're going to prevent their access. Um, so how do you implement something that's that vague and not really realistic for um, creating a system? So the idea of this is to reduce risk and unwanted bias and to really help support the inspection and mitigation planning that the team needs to do. And it can be used even to um, uh, fill your, your backlog, uh, you know, as you identify tasks and things that you need to do by tracking them and, uh, and getting them into your, into your work. So briefly, I'm going to talk about um, this framework, the UX framework for design trustworthy AI. And this is another set of tools. Uh, and actually that checklist was developed through this work um, where there are four aspects that I'll go through. Uh, one is being accountable to humans, making sure that humans are always in control, that we're building systems and we're being cognizant of speculative risks and benefits, that we're building systems that are respectful and secure, and that the system is also honest and usable. And so uh, if you uh, consider a, um, a set of um, fast food restaurants and uh, these, these restaurants tend to be staffed by uh, individuals who are not um, full-time employees in the United States being full-time is, I, I, I don't know how, uh, how uh, uh, benefits work in the, uh, in the Pakistan, but, uh, but in the US, if you don't work full-time, you don't gain full benefits like healthcare and things like that, it's a mess. But um, the uh, but so for the fast food restaurant, people work on shifts, which are short periods of time of work. And the goal of uh, this new pretend system that I'm going to talk about is that uh, the managers are going to be able to make faster staffing decisions and scheduling of those small pieces of time, and that they'll, it will reduce um, the bias of shift selection. So right now, the managers, um, because it's easier for them, they might pick the same individuals for better shifts during the day, um, or they might pick the people they like to get those shifts that they prefer, um, and then people that they don't like as much or that are harder to schedule may not get any good shifts um, any longer periods of time, meaning they're getting less money more, most likely and also having uh, more difficult personal lives. So the idea of this is to make it a little bit more fair. So with accountable to humans, with that aspect, we want to ensure that humans have ultimate control and that they're able to monitor and control risk. And an important aspect of this that's not necessarily applicable for this example, but we want to think about making sure that humans are responsible for final decisions that regard a person's life, their quality of life, their health, or their reputation. So really making sure that that is always reserved for a human uh, decision. And part of this is also, of course, ensuring that humans can unplug the machines, as Grady Booch uh, talks about in a uh, TED Talk from a number of years ago. We want to make sure that uh, there are secure backdoors that people who need to get into the system and sh shut it down or revert to a previous version can. Um, we can we can stop uh, the system or uh, again revert uh, to another uh, version if needed. And uh, those significant decisions that we give the AI system permission to make um, should be explained, able to be overridden, and appealable and reversible. And so with regard to right staff, we would want to make sure that the manager is able to reschedule people as needed. And so that maintains that control for the human, uh, the manager here, and, uh, and make sure that the system is uh, doing the right thing. So responsibilities and limitations also need to be explicitly defined between the AI system and the human. So thinking about with right staff, it might be 
you know, deciding who is going to the machine or the human uh, imp schedule employees or define shifts or deal with new information. So is the manager dealing with sick time or are we providing that to the AI system? How do we manage resignations? Thinking about those kinds of new information changes to the system and, and how that's managed is important. And then with regard to uh, that activity I talked about earlier, abusability testing, one way to think about this might be if we're adding a feature uh, to the system to enable it to turn itself off, um, what would be the limits to that? Um, how would that be communicated to the managers and how could it be misused or abused? We wanna think about the implications and the risks there as well. The second area is speculation, being cognizant of speculative risks and benefits. So really identifying that full range of harmful and malicious use, but also the good and beneficial use of a system. We really wanna explore the full system. An AI system is never just, or rarely anyway, just um, one tiny um, application. It, it is usually um, incorporated into a much larger system um, with all kinds of other um, needs and, and behaviors. And we need to think about how, um, when that AI piece, when the machine learning piece is, is put into that system, how the whole system um, responds to that as well. And again, thinking about those unwanted, unintended consequences. So a lot of this is doing user experience research and activating curiosity in our team members, thinking about how the system can be misused and abused, those potentially severe abuse uh, and, and consequences and how we can either ideally prevent or again, mitigate those. And then the perspective of frequently uh, marginalized groups and making sure that we're keeping them in mind. And this is an, a screenshot or a, a photo of a, uh, um, a activity uh, that was just done on paper um, at a workshop I went to uh, where we, we did these activities for, for um, imaginary groups. And these, these are great workshops to do. I've run many of these to help people understand how to do this work and to do it well. Um, and with the Black Mirror episode, like that, that worst case scenario, we could think about what happens when right staff begins prioritizing people with easier schedules. Um, are the managers, um, you know, approving those schedules and therefore reinforcing that bias? You know, this is exactly what we built the system not to do. So this is a problem. People who were already being discriminated against are now continuing to be discriminated against because the system found that pattern in, in previous data and followed it. So how could we prevent that from happening? How do we make sure that there are safeguards in place to prevent the specific uh, reason for, for building the system? It may not be, uh, again, the system may not be one for uh, an AI system to be um, used with because of existing bias in the data. So we also want to make sure that we create communication and mitigation plans for dealing with situations that uh, that may arise, thinking about who can report uh, unwanted consequences, who would they report it to, how do we turn the system off, who's notified, and thinking about the consequences. If we need to take the system offline, how do we uh, continue to do the work? What is the default um, program that people will use? How do we make, make sure that people aren't losing skills because they're relying on the system now? Um, if the system becomes unusable, how are we going to make sure that they can still do that work? The third area is respectful and secure. So really thinking about the values of humanity, ethics, equity, fairness, accessibility, diversity, and inclusion, and respecting people's privacy and data rights, making sure that the system is robust, valid, and reliable, and providing understandable security. And so with right staff, we want to think about who has visibility for uh, the changing schedules. How, how do we convey that? Who has access to that? How is that information used? And how are we protecting personally identifiable information of the individuals? Um, if we don't need to collect the information, we shouldn't. So in the US, it's a social security number is a very important um, personal identifier. And so we probably would want to make sure that that is not in the scheduling system, uh, if at all possible. So keeping information out of a system can prevent it from being um, accessed um, by other people. And so collecting less information is a good thing. Um, and then honest and usable. How do we value transparency with the goal of engendering appropriate or calibrated trust? Um, and of course, making sure that the system always is explicit about identifying itself as a machine or computer, um, particularly with chatbots. Um, so the, the voices are getting better and better, but we want to make sure that people understand they are not communicating with a human, but rather a machine and, and making that explicit 
keeps that calibrated trust um, aspect um, in uh, the right uh, the right level, which is what we want. So um, with fairness, we want to think about that bias that's in data and show the awareness of known and desirable bias. The reason why the system is built is because there's you know somebody who wants to do something. There's a purpose for this. What is that? Um, and acknowledging the issues, you know, what it's limited to do, um, where it does not work as well, those types of aspects, and then communicate, over communicate on those issues. So with right staff, we want to make sure that the system is built to reduce the known bias in existing data, and we want to make it easy to report um, any uh, unintended bias or bias that the system is learning um, and ideally prevent it. So this work is, you know, important to provide transparency regarding the AI's limitations, the system's limitations, and what are those boundaries and unfamiliar scenarios, the areas where the system is going to struggle. We want to encourage appropriate or calibrated trust, speculate about misuse and abuse, and prevent or plan to uh, mitigate situations. And then the challenges here are we need more speculative activities. The, the people who do this work need to, to make more. Um, we need to engage people in this hard and necessary work and make sure that we are building on existing best practices from the user experience and the human computer interaction areas as well as accessibility and many other best practices. And uh, AI systems are not fully able to team with humans yet. So we need to be ready, but also realize that, that this work is ongoing and, and there's a lot left to do. And that last topic I'm going to briefly talk about is critical oversight. Um, so with critical oversight, we really need to understand back to the, the first topic, what are we doing, why are we doing it, and for whom, and how are we going to make sure that that continues to be the case? How do we do oversight on the system, make sure that we have identified risks that could come up because of bias, misuse, abuse, and unintended consequences, and then proactively consider those risks? So data, as I mentioned, this is, and I'm sure you were all aware, is the key to these systems. So the team really needs to understand the data. What is it? What's it about? What, what are all these columns for? What, what is the information that's contained here? And what was the provenance or the creator's motivation for putting this data together? Um, a common um, problem I've seen is where people receive data and then run um, common statistical analysis on it or just go ahead and plug in an API and see what they get. And in many cases, unfortunately, you can see that you'll have a high um, correlation or a high um, significance in, um, in, in the data that's not actually there that if you understood what the data was, uh, or if you talk to someone who's familiar with the data, they would say that what you found is impossible, that that's not actually there. Numerically, yes, but not, um, not actually true. Um, and so we have to be very careful about applying math um, to uh, systems that um, are social in nature and, and where the data um, is potentially complex or um, not understood by the individuals and, and talk to the subject matter experts that, that is aware of the data. There are resources for this, data sheets for data sets, model cards for ML systems. Uh, this deck will be made uh, available to you so you'll be able to get to those links. Something uh, in, in the US anyway that, that is uh, very relevant is thinking about categorization, labeling uh, of information. So um, in uh, grocery stores in my neighborhood, tomatoes, um, which technically are fruit, are always with the vegetables in the vegetable section of the grocery store. This may be the case for you as well. So if I'm going to get a green pepper or a, um, which is also a fruit, <laughs> if I'm going to get carrots or potatoes, I can also pick up the tomatoes right beside them. Um, and then the green peppers are there as well. So, so they're, depending on who you're building a system for, a tomato may be a fruit for scientists and, and for individuals studying uh, that particular item. And it may be a vegetable if you're working with a grocery store. And so the people who are actually doing the labeling work need to understand that context. They need to understand what the end users are going to be um, using this information for and how it will be um, used so that it's, it's correct, so it's accurate. Another example um, of bias uh, in image recognition, particularly, can be with training data. So if the training data is red, green, and white cars, and the data that's encountered are also red, green, and white, wonderful. The, there is a match there, and that system will probably perform quite well. Um, however, if you have a system uh, that is trained with red, green, and white cars, and as we know, the reality is not that simple, um, when they encounter 
blue vehicles or vehicles in snow or in mud or if it's raining or if it's snowing or if it was only on uh, hilly areas and now we're in a very flat area or vice versa um, when the trees uh, get their leaves. All of these things will potentially create a system that is unlikely to recognize the actual data that it encounters because the data it was trained on is unrepresentative or incomplete. So we need to be very careful about um, training systems to uh, work well in uh, real systems when it's out in the real world um, encountering real data or to uh, fail in a graceful way so that they inform the end user, the person who's using the system, why it's unable to work or that it's not being used appropriately in some cases. So that bias can be in the data and the algorithm selection and the training. Mostly it comes from the data because the data um, is the key there. Algorithm selection certainly can introduce bias, but typically it is from the data and potentially the training and the way it was trained. But, but again, the data is the primary source. Um, so again, it can be purposeful and good which is fine. Um, it can also create situations where the system is misused and abused. So we need to understand the bias that's in the data and the amount of variance in that data and why that data was even created. What was the motivation for making that data set? What is the composition of it? What was the collection process? Sometimes that influences quite a bit. And what is it recommended to be used for? If we're using it for the wrong purpose, uh, we may have really um, unfortunate results that, that don't help us. So our goal is, of course, transparency and accountability and, and an understanding, a deep understanding of the work. So uh, Joy Bolimini says this best, data is a function of our history. The past dwells within our algorithms, showing us the inequalities that have always been there. So we really need to think about how we're applying this new information to uh, systems or these new technologies to existing data, I should say. Regular auditing needs to be part of this. These systems are not stable, they're dynamic. And so we need to continuously uh, be monitoring them. These, these aren't like the old systems we could set and forget. We have to actively be aware of what is changing in the system um, and access uh, the history of uh, you know, how it's being used and why, but also be, make sure that we're even doing that work in an ethical way. We also need to have uh, leadership in our organizations that help us to establish psychological safety so that we can question things, so that we feel safe in doing that and that we're supported in that work. So there's a lot of challenges here as well. We need to broaden our work still. We need to examine the dynamic data and the dynamic outcomes and, and figure out ways to really continue to maintain calibrated trust and make sure that the system is really working in the way we intend it to, that it's being an effective collaborator. And uh, we really need to figure out what standard methods and processes we should use to do this work. Some of the work I'm doing is on hazard analysis and making better tools for that type of work as well. So we aren't perfect. AI will not be perfect. Um, it will hopefully ensure appropriate human judgment, not replace it. We want to make sure, again, that humans are always in control and making those decisions that are important and, and uh, you know, significant. That we're empowering diverse teams and in inclusive environments so that we have differently thinking people, people with different experiences, bringing their awareness and knowledge. That we adopt technical ethics to help bring this all together that we encourage deep conversations, and that we are activating curiosity, being speculative and imaginative, and making sure that people continue to be uh, you know, somewhat skeptical of the systems in, in an appropriate way. So again, taking those best practices that we can build on in user experience and, and other um, practices as well, doing activities to make sure that we continue to question our work and, and think critically about it, uh, to make responsible and human-centered ethical uh, artificial intelligence. And I hope we have some time for questions. Here's my contact information. If anyone has any questions, you can raise your hand and your mic will be enabled. You can also use the chat if you'd like. Mm -hmm. 
मैम आई एक्चुअली हैव अ क्वेश्चन एक्चुअली आई रीड एन आर्टिकल बिफोर अबाउट ए आई बींग डॉक्टर देर इज अर्जन ए आई डेट ऑपरेट ऑन पेपर आई सी इट एज अ बिग रिस्क वट इज योर ओपिनियन अबाउट दिस Uh, so the the system is doing it's doing surgery. Is that what you said? Risk like people don't trust robots to that extent to actually operate on us. Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and and I think that that you depending on the situation that that's a reasonable concern. So some of the new uh, systems. So there's a Da Vinci system. Oh, sorry, there's a siren. Um, there's a system called Da Vinci that. Um, has a human operating, but they're using um, robotic arms to assist their work, and so that is is an extremely effective uh, collaboration between a human and a machine, where the human is still very much in control, um, but they're using a system to support that uh, work. And I, from my understanding, um, again, at least in the United States, that that is the standard, and that um, we are not um, interested in allowing systems to do that without a human um, maintaining control. Um, and and that I would hope uh, that that continues to be the case. I would be very concerned if uh, machines were doing uh, completely unsupervised uh, surgery um, or anything critical like that um, without a human involved. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Also, ma'am, I'm very grateful for such a wonderful talk. Thank you. I think there was another hand, or was I? Maybe not. Actually, a follow-up question on that. Um, I read that article as well. Um, I, I, you just said that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay uh, sorry. Uh, I also read that article, and you just said that uh, the unsupervised robotics is concerning, actually. But people, like sometimes, even I also think about it. It is very risky, even with supervised. So uh, people would not like a robotic hands, like dig on their body or something like that. So, what about that perspective? Yeah, yeah, and that's certainly um, something to consider. And and I think in a lot of cases, people. Um, do uh, want to have a human doing the surgery and, and not a machine. There are also people who prefer a machine and not a human. Um, so part of that is um, figuring out what um, what can enable calibrated trust. So helping people to understand how the system works, what its capabilities are, what the human is going to maintain control of. And uh, some of that um, may never be popular for some people. Some people may never want uh, a robot to do uh, to do surgery, and and other people may be very excited about it. And so part of this is understanding that people that that the systems are being designed for, and making them in ways that can build again that calibrated trust. It, it's a really difficult um, problem to uh, for us to solve and to figure out. There's no one right answer either. It's going to be different um, culturally depending on. Um, the the people involved. Um, it may be different um, depending on the hospital or, or the, the physician. Some physicians may not want to use those systems. Um, and I, I think that's okay. Um, we, we need to figure out what's right for individuals and uh, and not forget that, that humans are the purpose for these systems. These systems are meant to help us um, and to um, ensure that we are getting value out of the systems. And if they're not performing that way, um, there may be uh, problems with the design of the system. There may be problems with communication. Um, it may be a bad system. Um, and, and being willing to say no to the wrong types of technology is really important as well. All right. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And if, if you can send me the link, I'm curious to, to see that. I, I, I don't think I've seen that article. Yeah, sure. Uh, Ma'am, I do have a question. Uh, well, a lot of effort and research is being made in the direction of super AI, creating an AI that's you know much more than just uh, increasing our efficiency as humans. But in order to do that, I don't think when we achieve that, you know, AI or robot would be would try to you know uh, take a note of ethics and keep ethics in mind when they're well, performing their tasks and everything. So, what is your perspective on the you know? creating super AI or some a system that's so intelligent and so advanced for the 
for the world. Yeah, I'm I'm against that. Um, I uh, to your point, they cannot be taught ethics. They're computers. They're not humans. Um, computers do not have the same consequences that humans do, and so they have no need to worry about future generations or to worry about the environment or anything else. Um, and and they also um, are likely if we do make system sentient, if, if we make them fully autonomous in, in all that that could potentially mean, then all of a sudden we have a whole nother group of individuals that need rights and responsibilities. And we have enough challenges with the humans on the planet. Um, I, we do not need another set of individuals. And particularly um, because they're unlikely to want to do the work we want them to do. They're likely to want to go travel or go to space or something, um, which is wonderful, but um, also not the goal of uh, computing and, and uh, making artificially intelligent systems is about helping us, not uh, creating a whole new group of individuals. So there are many ethical problems uh, in creating systems that are that uh, autonomous, and uh, I do not think it's a good idea. Uh, I, I'm very much against um, even wasting the time doing that. Um, particularly when relatively simple systems have already caused uh, so much uh, danger and, and, uh, and damage to individuals already. Um, we're, we're still very early in this work, and uh, I hope that we decide not to do that. Thank you so much for your perspective, ma'am, especially about your point that we already have enough problems with ethics being um, you know, overlooked in our society today. If anyone else has any questions, please raise your hand. Uh, I think those are all the questions for today. So on behalf of GCU ACM Students Chapter, the Department of Computer Science and GCU University Lahore, I would really like to thank you, Professor, for delivering such an engaging and amazing talk. I, I loved it personally, and it has been a real pleasure to host you. And I'm sure everyone who attended got to learn a lot from it. And we do hope you join us again for another session in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd love to. Yes, thank you very much. And, and uh, reach out if you have further questions. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, ma'am.